المقاومة لا تستطيع أن تقف مكثوفة الأيدي ويفشى ظهرها ليس حزبا لبنانيا ولكنه فرقة إيرانية Good afternoon and thank you for joining us on Future TV. I'm Linda Tamim and these are today's top stories. Tripoli MP Mohamed Kabara gives a 48-hour ultimatum for the state to end violence in Tripoli. The UN says there are reasonable grounds to believe that limited amounts of chemical weapons have been used in Syria. And Russian President Vladimir Putin says Moscow has not yet delivered its sophisticated S-300 missiles to the Damascus regime. Supporters and opponents of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in Tripoli have exchanged sniper, fi sniper fire on the northern city's waterfronts. At least five people have been killed and more than 33 wounded in renewed clashes that began Sunday between pro-Assad Alawite fighters in the Tripoli neighborhood of Jabal Mohsin and mainly Sunni gunmen in nearby Bab al-Tabbani. Sniper fire continued to be heard overnight and this morning in the Jabal Mohsin and Bab al-Tabbani battlefronts, including Bakar, the Hariri Project, Rifa, and Mankubin. Schools and colleges near the areas of fighting remained shut and so were many businesses. The Bab al-Tabbani segments of Tripoli's international highway remained closed due to sniping and little traffic was reported elsewhere in the city. No casualties have been reported so far. Tripoli MP Mohamed Kabara has given a 48-hour ultimatum for the state to control the situation in Tripoli. The lawmaker accused President Michel Sleiman, Prime Minister Najib Mikati, and our Army Commander Jean General Jean Ahwaji of cooperating with the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. The follow-up committee derived from Tripoli's deputies meeting has convened at Kabara's residence to discuss the security situation that re-erupted in the city since Sunday. The committee has called upon the President of the Republic to summon the Higher Defense Council and establish security plans to end the violence in Tripoli. The attendees express astonishment over the continuous deterioration of the security situation in the city. They also confirmed that the snipers should be arrested as they create tension in the city and threaten the citizens' security. Lebanese President, President Michel Sleiman has renewed, reviewed the situ security situation in Tripoli during the meeting with Lebanese Army Commander General Jean Ahwaji. Meanwhile, Interior Minister Marwan Sherbel has revealed that the majority of fighters in Tripoli are no longer following the orders of their leaders. Before chairing a meeting of the Central Security Council, Sherbel said most of the gunmen in Tripoli are acting on their own and have gone out of the politicians' willingness to end the strife. He added that all ministers and MPs are united politically in order to end the strife. The minister also praised the efforts of the Lebanese armed forces and the security forces in Tripoli to maintain calm. UN human rights investigators say there are reasonable grounds to believe that limited amounts of chemical weapons have been used in Syria after interviewing victims, refugees and doctors. In their latest report, the independent investigators said they had received allegations concerning the use of chemical weapons by both sides, but most related to their use by government forces. Yumna Naufal reports. Crimes against humanity are happening every day in Syria, UN investigators say, with mounting evidence that both sides have committed massacres, engaged in torture and used chemical weapons. The UN Commission of Inquiry on Syria said that military and government leaders must be held accountable for implementing a concerted policy of human rights violations. The investigators said they had reasonable grounds to believe that limited amounts of chemical weapons had been used in Syria. Uh, government forces, as you see in the report, and affiliated militia have committed murder, torture, rape, forcible displacement, enforced disappearances, and other inhumane acts. Many of these crimes were perpetrated as part of uh, widespread or systematic attacks against civilian populations and constitute crimes against uh, humanity. 
uh, war crimes and gross, human rights, uh, gross violations of international human rights law, including summary uh, execution, arbitrary arrests and detention, and lawful attack, attacking protected uh, objects, and pillaging and destruction of prop property have also been uh, committed. Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, had earlier appointed a UN team to investigate alleged chemical weapons attacks in Syria after the Syrian government asked him to investigate a purported attack by rebels on March 19 on Khan al-Assal in the northern city of Aleppo. While the Syrian government insisted that an investigation be limited to that incident, that stressed for a broader investigation including a December incident in Homs. Investigators were eventually not allowed into the country. Any confirmation of the use of chemical weapons may escalate the international response to the more than two-year-old conflict which has killed more than 94,000 people. The latest UN report covering the period from mid-January to mid-May accused both sides of committing war crimes. It also accused rebels of carrying out executions without due process as well as committing torture, taking hostages and pillaging. But it said violations and abuses by the rebels did not, however, reach the intensity and scale of those committed by government forces and affiliated militia. Free Syrian Army's political and media coordinator, Luay Me'dad, has revealed that there are currently around 4,000 Hezbollah members fighting alongside the Syrian regime in Aleppo. This is according to the Pan-Arab daily, Ashar al awsat which quoted Me'dad saying that the fighters are getting ready to storm the province, half of which is controlled by the opposition. Hezbollah chief Said Hassan Nasrallah has promised these fighters will help deliver victory in the battle. Hezbollah's men are fighting alongside Syrian government troops in a fierce battle to retake the strategic Syrian town of Qusir from mostly Sunni rebels. The party, a close ally of Iran and the Syrian regime, has already lost dozens of its men in the battle for Qusir. Russian President Vladimir Putin says Moscow has not yet delivered its sophisticated S-300 missiles to the Damascus regime, despite hints from Syrian President Bashar al-Assad that such shipments had already been made. The Russian leader also warned that any foreign military in intervention in the 26-month crisis will fail. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu paid a special visit to Russia last month to convince Moscow not to make the shipments. Last week, Assad's suggestion that one of Russia's most advanced surface-to-air missiles had been delivered to the Damascus regime provoked condemnation from Western nations and fresh expressions of concern from Israel. Coming up next, a remarkable study reveals a simple vinegar test can slash cervical cancer death rates by one-third. Stay with us for more. Welcome back. Taksim Square is Istanbul's equivalent to Cairo's Tahrir Square or London's Trafalgar Square, and it is now the epicenter of demonstrations triggered by construction plans for a shopping center in one of the city's few remaining green spaces. Turkish Deputy Prime Minister Burlant Arink says he will meet some of the original organizers of the protest to save a park in Istanbul. Further details in this report. Police maintain high security in front of Prime Ministry in Istanbul after heavy clashes took place all night long. Bulldozers and civil municipality workers started to clear the barricades on roads leading to the Prime Minister's office. Police backed by water cannons also took security measures near the main roads. But the roads leading to Gezi Park, occupied by protesters, remain blocked by barricades set up by them. Tens of thousands of people took to the streets in Turkey's four biggest cities and on clashed with riot police in the fiercest anti-government protests in years. Moreover, thousands of public sector workers in Turkey are on a two-day strike in support of anti-government demonstrations. The strike was called by the Public Workers Union's Confederation in response to state terror implemented against mass protests across the country. It said the government of Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan had shown once again enmity to democracy. Social media was awash with reports and videos of police abuse. Turkey's Human Rights Foundation claimed more than a thousand protesters were subjected to ill-treatment and torture by police. Bulent Arnk, the deputy prime minister, on Tuesday apologized to protesters hurt in the clashes and said that he would meet some of the original organizers of a protest to save Gezi Park in Istanbul. Despite facing the biggest challenge to his rule since he came to office in 2002, Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan left Turkey earlier on Monday on an official visit to Morocco where he insisted the situation in his country was calming down. He earlier rejected talk of a Turkish Spring uprising by Turks who accuse him of trying to impose religious reforms on the secular state and dismissed the protesters as vandals, stressing that he was democratically elected. 
Erdogan also blamed the protests on extremists, dissidents, and the main opposition, Republican People's Party. An Egyptian court has sentenced 27 foreigners in abstentia, including 16 Americans, to five years in prison in a case against unlicensed non-governmental organizations. Today's verdict from a Cairo court comes after 43 Egyptian and foreign pro-democracy workers were accused of receiving illegal foreign funding. The case began in December of 2011 when the country was under military rule after police and prosecutors raided the offices of 17 organizations across Egypt, detaining employees and seizing computer files. Most of the foreign defendants were being tried in absentia as they left Egypt in March of 2012 when a court dropped a travel ban against them. The NGOs involved include Germany's Konrad Adenauer Foundation and three U.S.-based organizations. Current Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini has declared that enemies of the state of Iran sought to decrease voter turnout in the upcoming presidential elections. In a speech commemorating the 24th anniversary of the death of Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, the Ayatollah has urged the crowd to vote at one of the 66,000 available polling stations on June 14th, reminding Iranians that enemies of Iran wish either a low turnout in the election or sedition to emerge after. Although approximately 680 people registered as presidential hopefuls, Iran's Guardian Council narrowed the selection down to eight candidates only. The 35-nation Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency has continued its closed session meeting with Iran's nuclear program at the top of the agenda. Yukia Amano, Director General of the IAEA, has vented growing frustration at the lack of results in getting Iran to address suspicions of a military dimension to its atomic energy program, but Tehran has so far denied the accusations. In hard-hitting comments to the IAEA's 35-nation Board of Governors, Amano also said that Iranian advances in building a heavy water research reactor and its uranium enri enrichment work were in clear contravention of UN Security Council resolutions. The IAEA has been trying since early 2012 to engage with Tehran over what the Vienna-based UN agency calls the possible military dimensions to Iran's nuclear program. The waters of the Talta River, which have flooded parts of Prague, have peaked, raising hopes that the worst may be over for residents of the Czech capital. Forecasters said receding rains will help water levels to drop across the Czech Republic, but that parts of Germany, Slovakia and Hungary will be hit in the coming days. Thousands of people were evacuated from towns and cities downstream as a precaution. Swathes of suburban Prague were still underwater today after floods which have killed 11 people swept across Central Europe and the deluge moved towards Germany where more than 10,000 people have been forced from their homes. German Chancellor Angela Merkel says worst hits by severe flooding will receive 100 million euros in aid from the German government. And now for words, news around the world in brief, Queen Elizabeth marks the 60th anniversary of her coronation as a service in Westminster Abbey. The Queen was accompanied by her husband Prince Philip along with other royals including Prince Charles, his son Prince William and his pregnant wife Catherine. The Duchess of Cambridge is due to give birth to the third in line to the British throne in mid-July. It is the first time the couple have attended a public event at the Abbey where they married two years ago. Russian President Vladimir Putin has welcomed top European Union officials to the beginning of a one-day summit held in Yekaterinburg, a city in the Ural's mountains east of Moscow. President of the European Council Herman Van Rompuy and the European Commission President José Manuel Barroso were present at the meeting, where talks were expected to focus on bilateral issues between Russia and the EU, as well as on international topics such as Syria. A South African judge has postponed until August 19th the murder trial of global athletics star Oscar Pistorius, who has been charged with shooting death his girlfriend on Valentine's Day. Pistorius, 26, had to make his way through a scrum of photographers and reporters as he made his first formal public appearance since his release on bail in February. The double amputee athlete has admitted shooting Riva Steenkamp, 29, four times through a locked bathroom door on February 14th at his home in Pretoria. A simple vinegar test has been found to slash cervical cancer death rates by one-third in a remarkable study of 150,000 women in the poor areas of India, where the disease is top cancer killer of women. The research effort was led by Dr. Surendra Sastri of Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. 
The study tried a test that costs very little and can be done by local people with just two weeks of training and no fancy lab equipment. They swabbed the cervix with diluted vinegar, which can make abnormal cells briefly change color. The study found this low-tech visual exam cut the cervical cancer death by 31 percent. Experts have called the outcome amazing and estimate it could prevent 72,600 deaths worldwide each year, allowing treatment before it's too late. This marks the end of our bulletin, our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our headlines. Tripoli MP Mohamed Kabara gives a 48-hour ultimatum for the state to end violence in Tripoli. The UN says there are reasonable grounds to believe that limited amounts of chemical weapons have been used in Syria. And finally, Russian President Vladimir Putin says Moscow has not yet delivered its sophisticated S-300 missiles to the Damascus regime. Those were today's headlines from Future TV, live from Beirut. We'll be back again tomorrow for more updates. I'm Linda Tamim, wishing you a very nice evening. <laughs> ليس حزبا لبنانيا ولكنه فرقه ايرانيه